Ben Court is an advocate for treatment and recovery that comes from his own personal journey. Currently the CEO of an addiction treatment center called The Foundry, Ben is also a TED Talk speaker, an author, by the way, this is a must read for anybody in the field, read Inc., and a consultant on marijuana recovery policies. He also has been in recovery from substance use disorder since 1996. So without further delay, I present you, Ben Court. So the very first thing that I need you to understand, maybe the most important thing that I can share with you is that um, if you'll read this advertisement on the screen in front of me, uh, we are going to be talking about the new school cannabis and not what you smoked in the 70s. And, and listen, the reason why it's so important for you to hold on to this, especially those of you who are considering and, and making laws around this, especially our political leaders, um, is that it's very, very difficult a lot of the times for us to see the world uh, through a construct that's greater than our own lived experience. And so for so many of us, so I got sober um, June 15th of 1996. I was out east back in, in Washington, D.C. Um, but for so many uh, people who used uh, cannabis in years past, you know, there's this, there's this old adage about weed, this old joke that says that the most dangerous part about marijuana is getting caught with it. And for a very, very long time, there was a somewhat disproportionate reaction from, um, in, in, in my opinion, there was a somewhat disproportionate reaction um, to cannabis use because it wasn't that bad of a drug. It, it certainly had its made trouble and it wasn't benign. It's never been benign. However, it's not the same thing we're consuming today. So what's ended up happening is a lot of the people who in my world are on the treatment side and trying to educate on it or on the law enforcement side and trying to um, uh, keep up with everything that's going on or trying to make the laws around um, uh, cannabis policy today, we're still thinking about it like that drug of the 70s or the 80s or, or even the 90s or even the 2000s. So um, here's a big, giant, broad statement that I'd like to make to you that I think will probably ruffle a few feathers, but let's ruffle away. If you're talking about weed and you're not frustrating a few people, you're probably not having an honest conversation. Um, unless you have consumed a THC-based product that was made with the intent of getting you high, so something made to get you high, that was purchased commercially in the last three or four years, I hate to tell you, but you got no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't care what you did at that Joe Walsh concert or that Cypress Hill concert for that matter. It's irrelevant. And the reason why that irrelevance can be scary and damaging sometimes is, is, is we think we know what we're talking about because we're like, oh, buddy, don't tell me. I don't know about weed. You weren't with me in the 80s. You didn't see what happened to my uncle in the 90s. I know. Unless you've consumed something that was purchased commercially in the last couple of years, you're so behind on the times right now that we probably need some different words to describe what it is. I've written an article about that. Maybe one day we'll have them because we're not talking about the cannabis plant anymore. We are talking about a commercialized market that has been built to support a component of the cannabis plant. So, 200 and some chemicals inside of cannabis before you light it on fire. That ends up being 500 and some after you light it on fire. There are two of them that matter the most. The few of them matter as well, but two of them that by far matter the most. The, the first one is CBD, and we're, we're not going to go into that this evening, uh, but there are a number of reasons why CBD, an utterly non-intoxicating component inside of cannabis, is interesting. Um, however, there are about a million more reasons why THC is interesting. So THC is the, all capital letters, the psychoactive component inside of cannabis. You take the THC out of it, you've got hemp. You have an interesting textile that used to make ropes and now makes like shoes and clothing and stuff like that. Um, you have something that is not intoxicating that is not going to damage the human brain. You add THC to it, 
we get the psychoactive part. With the, the more of that psychoactive component we have, the more potential um, we have to do damage to the human brain. So let's discuss THC for just a minute and let me point something out to you from some phenomenal data from uh, University of Mississippi, which unfortunately ended in 2010. We've got data through 2011. It looks like it might pick back up again. There's a private funding effort underway to, to allow this to happen again because we don't have any data past 2011 from this. Um, but what happened was, was for 50 years, we tracked the average THC potency inside of cannabis from all over the country. And we can learn so much from these data. It's a big, giant, huge, interesting set. But I, I really just wanna point out um, a couple of things right now. If we had more time, I'd point out a bunch more. But first, um, let me just point out at the beginning, hopefully you can see my cursor here, where we started with this. When we first started measuring THC inside of cannabis in 1960, what we saw um, was the less than half of a percent um, THC inside of the cannabis plant. And now, were we to extend this line into perpetuity to when we came out of the ocean or the ooze or the garden or whatever works for you, were this line to go back forever, it would always look the same. Humankind has interacted with the cannabis plant since the dawn of time, but we have interacted with the cannabis plant at less than half of a percent potency. And the reason why that's so important, the reason why that matters so much it, it is that the, um, the knowledge that we have of how this is interacting with the human brain and body is based on considerably lower levels of THC that are counterbalanced by um, higher levels of CBD because naturally occurring cannabis has a one-to-one -one ratio of THC to CBD. And that's so incredibly important. Um, we won't go into it right now. Maybe, maybe you can read some of the stuff I've written or talked about or lots of other people have as well, um, why that's so important. What I'd like to draw your attention to, though, is the increasing amount of THC found in the cannabis plant in America. And the reason for that is really, really simple, because this is a country that supersizes its Big Macs. This is a country where if one is good, two is better. We, we brought you professional wrestling. You're welcome, world. Um, if we can get high doing something, if we can get some sort of dopamine spike doing something, we're going to do it, and we're going to do it as often as we can, as a rule. So we, as we started to selectively breed this plant and create generation after generation after generation of a stronger and more potent version of cannabis, this is what has happened. The average potency has grown. Now, uh, again, I don't have the time to bore you with all the interesting stuff that's taken place through this. But what I would like to point out to you before I change slides, and if any of you have seen anything I do before, you know how important this is, it is that we are looking at increments of 2.5% over the course of 50 years. And you see how it's growing. The blue line is when I add in Colorado which unfortunately we haven't had data since 2015 on that. So it looks like that data set in all likelihood will not be continued. And if it will, there will just be a gap from 2015 to 20 whenever we pick it back up. But in the couple years post commercial sales in Colorado, I want you to look at what happened. And I want you to go back to that statement that I made a couple of minutes ago where, where, where I, I, I said, unless you've consumed something in the last couple of years, because um, my friends, this line has continued to go up at this trajectory. I just don't have the data for it. Nobody has the data for it. We, if you can see this cursor here, we continue to talk about this plant 
and try to understand and regulate this plant when in reality what is being consumed and what is being sold and abused is this drug which is doing new and different and damaging things to the human brain and body and things that were we to have suggested 10 years ago could be associated with cannabis use you'd have been laughed right out of asam if you said these things because when it was a plant we had relatively few issues associated with it now that it has become this commodity this drug that's changed quite a bit what we did was we went from good gardeners to good chemists and when we moved away from the backyard grows to to the purely 100% indoors that are run by corporations and the, the money behind it again we don't we don't have time to get into all of that um, something shifted fundamentally an arms race started and that arms race was how potent can we make this how quickly because that's what's going to separate you out from the competition I'll show you why that matters in a second. Before I show you why that matters, I'd like to hopefully um, address one of the most common questions that I get asked uh, on this. And um, typically when I give a talk, if I don't address this right away, one of the first questions I get is, is, is Ben, do you really believe that marijuana is addictive? And I like to answer that um, by, by saying, I believe that marijuana is addictive in the same way that I believe Canada lies directly north of Colorado. It's not a belief, it's a fact. Because I can't arbitrarily assign the diagnosis of substance use disorder, addic addiction. I can't do it. Um, nobody can, can take one look at you and say, oh, addict, yep, yep, addict. Um, look at the clothes he's wearing, look at the music he's listening to, look at the car she's driving, addict. No, what you do is you take these 11 diagnostic criteria and you apply them to a person's life. If the person meets two or three of those criteria, they have a substance use disorder that's classified as mild, four or five, moderate, six or above, like myself when I was using, um, they have a severe substance use disorder. So I'm not gonna waste your time running through all of these. Those of you who work inside of my field know the importance of the DSM-5 and the lessons, uh, new lessons that we've learned from it. Um, and, and I really like these. I think they should be weighted is my only suggestion if there's anybody out there involved in the DSM. The other thing that the DSM did was in this last version, which came out, I think it's been maybe, maybe four years. Maybe it's been four years. The DSM gave us objective criteria for cannabis withdrawal, <laughs> physical withdrawal from THC. Now, if you've been around at all, especially if you were around in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and somebody says cannabis withdrawal, your first reaction might be to laugh at them a little bit. Like, oh yeah, I remember cannabis withdrawal. I didn't eat nearly as many donuts and I discovered that Yanni's music actually really sucked. It's not innovative and groundbreaking in the way, the same way I thought of it. Um, and it just isn't. Listen, I've seen Yanni three times live. The last time I saw him, I was sober and I was just kind of scratching my head wondering. And, and anyway, enough about Yanni. Um, cannabis withdrawal, physical withdrawal and the physical dependence on THC is a phenomenon that's only a couple of years old. And the reason why it exists is simple. It's not because we weren't looking for it before. Um, <laughs> it's because when you were talking about a plant that had half a percent, 1%, 2%, 5% THC, it wasn't a thing. But when we get into this um, highly manufactured, high potency THC product, it becomes a thing. And it's actually a very, very important thing if you are someone who sells cannabis. So cannabis use disorder is a thing, objectively diagnosable. Cannabis withdrawal 
and physical dependence on cannabis is a thing. For those of you inside of the treatment world, anybody who works inside of MySpace, I'd really, really like to encourage you to get as educated as possible on this because we can provide better care um, when, when we know what people are going through. Now, let's get into some of the why it matters so much. And, and before I give you the what I think is the main reason behind all of these, I'd like to address um, I, I hope some of the raised eyebrows that we've made in the last two slides, and that is around THC and addiction. And I'm going to try to speak to multiple different audiences here with a few of these um, points, but I'd like you to hear and understand some things that I'm in Colorado. So I live in Boulder County, Colorado. Our program is in Steamboat, um, but when we first made this move, I was at the University of Colorado Hospital in Denver inside of their chemical dependency treatment program. And so, come on, like we know a thing or two inside of the treatment world in Colorado about cannabis use disorder. And I want you to understand that THC addiction is very, very real. And I want you to understand that it is not at all easy to treat for a number of reasons, it's not easy to treat. Paul, it was funny when you sent me that question and said, where is your chapter in this book? I, I, I just got my book yesterday in the mail um, from them. And because I'm a contributing author or not a whatever, uh, I'm not listed on any of it, but um, a dear friend of mine, Dr. Letitia Bader and I put together uh, a chapter for um, a book uh, called uh, by Springer called um, Cannabis and Medicine, an Evidence-Based Approach, which is now required learning for every um, new physician in the country. And one of the things that, that we did was took a real deep dive into our understanding and lack of understanding of what it takes to treat the THC addicted patient. And it is not easy for a number of reasons. It's not easy. So those of you who work inside of my world, reach out, talk to one another, study, learn, because you know the numbers that we're seeing and you know we gotta learn how to handle this. THC addiction often requires long stays in treatment as well as antipsychotic medications. And for those of you who like my program is insurance-based, um, we work with people who are dependent on that insurance as do most folks and John does as well. Most of you know that um, insurance doesn't like paying for treatment. And if they can get away with not paying for treatment for any reason, they're going to do it, especially if it's just weed. And they can say, oh, okay, 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 inpatient treatment for weed, sure, whatever, utilization review professional, okay, they need treatment. After three or four days, they're going to be saying, get, get out of there. When in reality, what we see a lot of the time are several months before a person's cognitive ability is even come back to a place where we can start talk therapy with them. And oftentimes that depends on um, them being on the appropriate antipsychotic medications because the rates of psychosis associated with this are, are so um, significant. So traditional rates of addiction, when we measured these things up until about 2012, the last time we had a real good look at them, traditional rates of addiction to, to THC were around 10%. So of everybody who, um, uh, put THC into their body, roughly 10% of them would develop at some point in their life a diagnosable um, cannabis use disorder. Um, those rates today, uh, in, a, in a phenomenal meta study published uh, October of last year, um, show us that they actually reach 30%. So um, since the last time we looked at those data in 2012 until 2020, in just eight years, um, it's been a multiplier of three by how, how addictive this is. And again, the reason is really, really easy. It's just a potency thing. This is potency. And a lot of the patients who we treat who are addicted to THC require real physical detox as well as medical intervention. So again, I, I hope you read some more about this. I'd love it if you read some of the stuff I wrote about it because I think we had some good ideas, but there are a lot of people who've written great things. I'll give you resources at the end. For those of you who work inside of my world, please join me in treating people who have cannabis use disorder um, well, because it's hard. And I think a lot of the times we can actually push them away from treatment if we're not careful, if we look at them as second class addicts or things like this. So moving on, let's talk about why those things matter. Addiction 
dependence and withdrawal and why they are so important. The reality is that in 2014, when we opened our retail sales in Colorado, we had fewer than 300 cannabis facilities. By 2017, that number had grown by a factor of just about four. So in 2017, we had uh, just shy of 1,200 facilities in Colorado. And by the end of last or 2019, the last year we have data for, Colorado had 2,709 can licensed cannabis facilities in the state of Colorado. The question is, how can we support that amount of retail? And, and it is simple. We can support that amount of retail because there is a consumer base for it. So how can we can continue to grow that retail? Again, simple. This is Econ 101. Look at the top. Don't overcomplicate this. You can grow that if you grow the consumer base. So you grow the consumer base in one of two ways. There's no other way. It just isn't. There's one of two ways. You convert current users to more frequent users or you capture new users. That's it. That's it. So to maintain that growth or to even justify the growth that we have had up until this point, we consider that old 80-20 rule. Um, the data that SAMHSA has given us for, for 60 years, which shows us that about 80% of the, the addictive substances in this country, booze and tobacco and things, are consumed by about 20% of the consumers in this country. <clears throat> and in 2019, the last year for which we have data, hopefully we'll have, we won't have 2020 until the fall, but um, in 2019, the Marijuana Enforcement Division in Colorado in their annual report showed us that 6.1% of all of the users in Colorado purchased 75% of all of the THC products. And I really hope um, that you can let that sink in for a minute. Six percent of all of the users are purchasing 75 percent of the products. If you move away from the pejorative and I ask you to give me some words describing those people, some names for those people, again, and I don't let you use the pejorative, the first one that we're going to come up with is someone who has a severe substance use disorder. And people who have severe substance use disorders are much, much, much more likely to cannabis to come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds to um, have much lower rates of high school and college completion and most importantly, um, a much, much higher rate of mental illness. So the people who are absolutely necessary for the cannabis industry to exist, 75 cents on every dollar they make comes from these people are typically economically disenfranchised, pretty mentally ill, and absolutely dependent on cannabis. Where's the social justice on that one? So let me show you this. What happens to build that user, if you want to make the cannabis dependent patient, person, individual, there's four factors. One of them we have no control over. It's genetic predisposition. No control over it yet. I don't know. Give science a couple of years, who knows? Um, the three factors that will determine a person's propensity for dependence on this are age of onset, frequency of use, and potency. That's why it is so important and it is an absolute known and understood strategy that every purveyor of addictive substances targets youth. And if you don't think that the weed industry is doing what the tobacco industry did and what the alcohol industry did and the, I wonder what you are smoking because you're living in some sort of wonderful alternative universe where this is the first major multi-billion dollar corporate interest on the face of the planet to just wanna do the right thing. 
<laughs> it's just not how it works, man. They know that if they get you young, they know that if they get you using often, and they know that if they get you using the strong stuff, you have a much higher chance of becoming part of that group of people who are spending 75 cents on every dollar that they earn. Because we're not people to this industry. In the same way, we're not people to McDonald's or Monsanto or Walmart or whatever. We're demographics. And we are something that is, um, we're, we're a wallet, we're a credit card, we're, we're a number, we're a part of a group. And I hope you understand, especially you young folks, how important it is to this industry that they capture you and that they get you using anything strong and hopefully doing it often because that's how they're gonna pay the bills. Very briefly, I'm gonna give you an overview of some consumption trends. And the reason why I'm doing it so briefly is uh, because we are, so, so this will end at 8.15 your time, 6.15 my time. And I really wanna make sure that we have question time. Um, however, some of these are really, really important for you to understand. So please forgive me as I go quickly through these. Um, know that Paul, I'll share these slides with you. You're welcome to do anything you want to with them. In fact, if, if you ever want to give this presentation, you take my name off the front and, and put yours on it if you want to, just so long as the world knows this, the, this stuff. So concentrates, edibles, and vaping. We know a lot about vaping, so I'm going to skip over that, but I need you to understand what concentrates are. Um, this is an advertisement talking about, it says crack is back, and it goes on to discuss this. What, what they're talking about in this is crack weed. That's what it's affectionately referred to often. Um, and this is what it looks like. This is a, a distillate. There's isolates and distillates. This is a, a distillate. And this is a form of concentrate. And the thing that you got to understand about concentrates is that this is the majority of the market in Colorado. I can't tell you for other rec states because data tracking is really crazy. We spend more money in Colorado on concentrates than we do on anything else. So what I'm showing you isn't fringe use. It's not weird, crazy stuff. This is what people are initiating on. This is what they're vaping in their vape pens. This is what kids to kids, this is weed. This is what's being sold. I go to dispensaries all the time to check them out and see what's on the counter, see what the coupons are for. This is what's being sold. This is what's being advertised. And this is what's being promoted. This is legal recreational THC, crack weed. Concentrates can reach up to 99.9% .9 pure THC. And one of the many reasons why this is so um, disturbing is that there is next to no information and understanding of what's taking place inside of the human brain and body um, above 16% THC. We've got some indications and there's some ideas. It's, it's not good. <laughs> but when you go from, if you go back to that chart at the beginning and you remember that forever, we've been interacting with a half of a percent. Now to be consuming almost totally pure THC in the course of about, um, in, in, in the last couple of years, is a, it's scary. It should be scary because those of us in the front line of this, even those of us trying our very, very best to stay ahead of it and understand are learning on the job. And um, we're, we're out paced because this has gone quicker than our understanding of, uh, of what's happening to the human brain and body associated with it is. Um, uh, hyperemesis, uh, you know, cyclic vomiting, the, this thing that people talk about all the time. Uh, <laughs> to 10 years ago, that was like, I, I, I don't even know, you could survey a thousand physicians and one of them might even know what the word was. And now it's uh, a big deal in every ER across the country. The game has changed quickly. I'm not going to play videos. I'm going to tell you again, you're welcome to this. The bottom line is, my friends, for those of you inside of my world and, and for those of you uh, um, treating, for those of you educating around, and especially for those of you trying to build regulations around, we cannot fall back on our experience of learning how to drive in some old 
car that's going to maybe go 25 miles an hour downhill when what's being driven around town and what these kids today are learning on are these Bugattis that come off the line and, and hit 220. We aren't prepared to regulate what it is they're consuming because we don't understand what it is. Because back when I was a kid, 1996, before I stopped these things, this right here, you see that beautiful giant nug? That was weed. And no longer today, weed is butter and wax and shatter. The weed of the 21st century looks like this. It's resin that's pulled from. That is cannabis. And to your younger generation, to the, to the kids who've grown up inside of this world that for us is still almost a novelty. You know, we all remember when Colorado voted and, and we remember before that what it was like, but you got to think about what it's been like for, for my kids, for my daughter, 17 years old, who's never really known much of a world without legalized weed, commercialized weed, where you pass a couple dispensaries on your way to school every day. That is weed to this generation. This is marijuana. That's, um, th these are things that people don't even know what they are. Half the time I gotta call sponsees and ask what they are when I find out about them. But, but the, um, look, can you imagine the amount of scientific acuity it takes to go from a green organic material to this perfectly crystal clear liquid that then when it cools, it becomes um, like those rocks that I showed you at the beginning. And that is what's being sold as and accepted as weed all over Colorado, even though it's just THC. Interesting stuff to see, isn't it? That, that this is cannabis. And so I hope that you learn and you take some time to understand this um, that, that you realize that the message still exists. If you see this, that says going back to nature, don't forget your natural cannabis or your concentrate headquarters. <laughs> the day of the dabs, uh, 710, 710 is oil spilled upside down. Stop saying 420, you sound old. Say 710 and, and then you'll really get some looks from people. Um, the idea that it's still natural persists when in reality, these things are not. So basically, and I'm sorry, we're going to have to skip over the, the vaping as well as the um, edibles. I've, I've spoken quite a bit on these things. And while I don't um, keep after it, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot online out there with all of them. I'm just going to be sensitive to our time. Um, but you, you can see the range of, of edibles that we have, just a slight range of them. And I'd like to leave you with just a couple short little facts and a statistic or two, short little facts and a resource or two, that it's 16% THC, that this Lancet study has been um, updated three times. The first one was February, 2015, volume two, number three, the effects of high potency cannabis on psychosis. And it's 16% THC. Daily use, which is five times a week, so an increase in psychosis by a multiplier of five. Weekend use, which was twice a week. So an increase, a multiplier of three in psychosis. And a quarter of all of the psychosis in this sample group, it's a large N, a quarter of it, it was determined that the THC caused the psychosis solely. It was causal. That old causation correlation question with this Casual use sees a risk of depression increased by 1.4 times. It sees an increased risk of acute anxiety and an increased risk of anxiety disorders. We do not know if that's causal. We see worsened outcomes in treating bipolar disorder, and we see a twofold increased risk of um, suicide serious enough to require hospitalization with casual use. Again, you, you gotta, there's no reefer madness here. Because if we were talking about the weed of the 80s or the 90s, that's not true. Remember, we're not talking about the weed or the 80, of the 80s or 90s. Use of any 
cannabis of this of potency north of 10% is increased with a one and a half time uh, associated with a one and a half time increased risk of psychosis. Regular use, twofold increased risk of psychosis and the perfect storm, high potency cannabis, frequent use, genetic susceptibility, presence of those genes can increase the risk of psychosis by eight fold. And any usage before the age of 18 sees a two and a half time increase risk in the diagnosis of schizophrenia. It is dose responsive as well, which is a little bit scary. So forgetting this, here's a couple of resources for you. Project Sam, uh, again, on their board based out of the Northeast, Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Please go see what NIDA has got to say about it. The National Institute for Drug Abuse, SAMHSA. Smart Colorado is um, a, a group of uh, mostly moms here in Colorado who work together to tell their stories. There's lots of them. And I subscribe to just about every single pro cannabis newsletter and thing. You should see my inbox sometimes. It probably would, would freak you out. Um, <laughs> that's why I get advertisements for all these things. I think people um, be easy to misinterpret why I get all of these. But the reason why I get all of them is it's so important to stay up to date, up to the minute, because um, this is changing so quickly. And then, of course, if you're interested again and and probably not a very eloquent book, but hopefully one that will help you. That's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all that kind of business. And that's the end of that. We have time for questions. That was awesome, Ben. That was amazing, incredible, a lot of information. I'm looking at our participants. We were at 211 participants, and then it dropped to 210. So we obviously lost the Yanni fan. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, Yanni fan. <laughs> we have a lot of good questions here. We've actually had some questions that were sent ahead of time from the, the uh, New Canaan High School students. So I want to start oh, cool. with one of those. Big question that you've probably heard before. Is marijuana considered a gateway drug? Um, it, y yes, um, but we also want to be really careful with that because it can be the end in itself. The problem with saying gateway drug is a lot of the times what we're doing is we're telling people, well, it's not really serious until it gets to math. It's not really an issue until it becomes this. And if you guys want to know what the biggest gateway drug is for anybody um, is uh, tobacco. So um, stay away from all of these things and you have less of a potential to end up at the very worst end of them, but also know that all of them um, can be a big deal in and of themselves. Okay. And remember for the audience, the Q&A is in the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. We've got many more questions that people have already submitted. Are there THC Zoom recovery meetings available? Yeah, totally. Uh, in, in fact, the, the chapter that I alluded to in that, that book, um, we talked about that and it was pre-COVID and we went back and put a little thing in it post. Yes, Marijuana Anonymous um, has, I'll, I'll bet you there's 20 meetings going on right now. So you used to kind of have to live next to a major metropolitan area to get MA meetings. And now you can pick which one you want to go to online. Excellent. Here's another one from the students. Regarding sports and marijuana and THC, does it affect athletic performance in any way? Um, it, it, it does quite a bit, actually. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm really careful with how much I talk about this and how I do, and especially being recorded and being live. Um, I work for um, professional sports leagues and professional clubs, as well as collegiate, um, a, a lot of D1 and a few D2, D2 schools. Um, inside of all of their athletic departments. And the reason why um, the athletic departments in, in both professional sports as well as collegiate are so interested in it is because it's a performance issue. So it'll certainly affect um, issues. You, you know, a lot of the times you'll hear about a player who doesn't get drafted or, or doesn't get picked because of behavioral issues, uh, nine times out of 10. Um, I'm, a lot of times I'm actually on the other side of that door. Nine times out of 10, it's, THC. Um, but yes, performance is is absolutely affected by, and if I had a two-hour presentation in a room full of athletic directors, I could, I could get into the specifics of it. But yes, um, as an athlete, you should be cheering 
every time somebody you're going to play against on Friday night gets high. Great. Two people asked the same question regarding, is it an urban legend or is it real that uh, marijuana and THC use helps OCD? Um, OCD is sort of out right now. Uh, we can't answer that. And OCD is pretty tricky. Um, we know that for it, it's contraindicated for, um, for most other mental health disorders, especially ones that kids face. Um, and, and since that one's just past my scope and I've never read anything specific on OCD, I'd really advise you to talk to your doc. But we know for anxiety disorder, and a lot of OCD is rooted in anxiety, um, we know it's contraindicated, and makes it worse, makes anxiety disorders worse, as well as attention disorders. You mentioned detox, and I know that we look at the new terminology, which may help this audience understand it as withdrawal management. Is there a difference of people withdrawing from using THC by, by smoking it versus vaping it? No, um, no, the, the, the method doesn't matter so much on that as, as it is actually moving the THC out of one system. So no. Another question, my son has returned from rehab and after a few weeks, he started vaping THC saying it helped reduce his cravings for other drugs. Is this a good idea? No, it's not. Um, listen, I, <laughs> you can be careful on this and, and um, as somebody in recovery, one of the things that we learn is the incredible importance of not taking another person's inventory in recovery, we call it. So I wouldn't do that if somebody came up to me in, in a meeting and said that, but I will tell you here objectively that we've got the data. No, this is absolutely not a good idea. This leads towards other things and um, in and of itself, it's bad enough that we don't want anybody doing it, especially somebody young. Um, I, I hope that he can address that. And I know you got great resources there. I'm sure John could help with that. Um, yeah, please work on that with him. What is it about marijuana that makes people unmotivated? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the last word, John? Unmotivated. Oh, it's it's interesting. There's actually a, a medical term called amotivational syndrome that's only used with chronic marijuana use. Um, I, I don't know what it is that makes people, um, and, and I would say probably makes some people less motivated. Um, some people it won't have that effect on at, at all. Um, the, 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 you, get, you get a little more lethargic. Some people get more lethargic. Sometimes there's more eating. There's more things. I don't know specifically what it is about marijuana that does that, but I know it's a pretty well-documented association. Again, um, the, the, the fact that we have so, something um, chronic apathy that's associated with it is, is wild. It's not associated with anything else. If addiction is growing and potency is growing, why is legalization growing as well? Well, if, if this world were run on pure logic, um, we'd have a lot less pain and probably a lot fewer, I, I, because it's all about the money because the, the common sense doesn't drive it. Why do they still sell tobacco? Why do they sell Mad Dog 2020? Why can you buy a lottery ticket when you're 18 years old? The, the, the why is just because there's money to be made at it. And in a country that, that worships um, money, why, why wouldn't we? At the dispensaries, is the plant virgin less potent are also highly potent in the edibles and oils? Um, you can't get, so it, it would look like, a oh boy, I don't know, we'll see what happens this year in the annual cup, um, but it would look like you can't get much more than low 40% THC into a plant. There's just so much room inside of a plant, right? Like you gotta have all these other things. Um, so you're, you're not gonna have a plant that doesn't look like that's gonna be able to get to 99% THC because obviously, got to have a lot of other things in it. Um, so you can get much, much, much more potent with our concentrates um, and, and things like that. So the, the stronger you can grow the plant, which is why the indoor growing is such a big deal, the stronger you can grow the plant, 
the easier it is to refine that into a really high potency product. Um, if you were to be always working with a five or six percent THC plant to try to get um, an isolate out of it at 99 percent pure THC, um, I, I, I don't know what it would be, but it would take bales of that to get a drop or two of it because you'd have to refine it so many times. Like this question. How do parents talk to kids about addiction when the kids think it's legal, therefore it's safe? Use is so common that it seems inconsequential to them. You know, I guess what's what's interesting, um, and and John, I, I think that the you being local there, and I think Paul having this group that he does supporting it, you guys will have some good insight here too. Um, my advice to you is just to talk about it to not seed this, to not say, well, it's everywhere, que sera, sera. We do know that parents' opinions have really dramatic effects on kids' perceptions. They might not show it. They might even show the opposite of it. But if you engage with them, it's gonna settle back here somewhere. Even if they don't listen to it off the bat, I'll tell you with my own kids, um, I have been talking about this particular issue and all these related issues with them since they could understand that conversation. I, um, I think the importance of frequency, of asking them what they know and have heard and making sure that you're not afraid to have that conversation with them is so important, don't give it up. My daughter asked me, um, my wife and I last night, if she could go over to a new friend's house who she hasn't been over. And my wife's first question to her was, is there THC at the house to her parents use? That's just the kind of thing. You, but that's not police and stuff, or some of police. It's showing how much you care and it's showing how much you're gonna act. And a little tip I found with it um, too is something that we did at my house. We decided years ago, uh, we told the kids that if they made it through um, school without ever having used tobacco, alcohol, or weed, or any any drug, they'd get a trip anywhere in the world they wanted. And we still don't know how we're going to pay for it. It's yeah. but rehab. So, John, do you have any ideas on, on yeah. that? Well, I, I think that your suggestions are great and your strategy is great, Ben, because we know incentives work. If the incentive is appetizing to the kid, we also know, like I mean, you referenced it as well, it's more important to show your kids how much you care before you show them how much you know. And from your presentation tonight, it's pretty clear we don't know much if we're still thinking that it's the marijuana from the Joe Walsh concert. By the way, I can't even believe people can remember Joe Walsh. So <laughs> that idea that we have to lead with our humbleness, lead with our humility, lead with our authenticity of not knowing and trying to learn, I think is great. Another perfect example with weed is scared straight doesn't work, right? Reef, what is it? Uh, uh, reefer madness is a perfect example of trying to use scared straight and it, and it loses your credibility to try to scare the kids instead of giving them real scientific information, meeting them where they're at, being able to not insult their intelligence or their own experience with what's going on in the world today. And I, I think that would count for a lot as well of just really being able to kind of show like your your, your powerlessness is your greatest sense of being able to have some leverage. Mm. So don't get me started. I'm family therapist by trade. So I really <laughs> All right. We got a lot of other questions. Here's a question. As, can you die from with this new THC? Are there THC and marijuana deaths specifically related to too, too much use? Oh, okay. Look, if any of you've ever engaged with anybody on this subject, you know, this is one of the first things that they're gonna bring up. Nobody's ever died from. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that bothers me so much is the number of people who have lost their lives from. And how, um, how, how sad it is to me that they have to go through life having had lost somebody continuing to hear this. You cannot overdose from THC. It doesn't work that way. Um, it, it's not like there's no level of lethal ingestion of THC. However, people die doing dumb stuff all the time. And people do lots more dumb stuff when they're high. 
So I wrote a chapter about this in the book and there are parent support groups. In fact, there's, there's um, a very serious effort underway in Colorado to limit potency in a bill and the bill is called Johnny's Bill named after a young man who um, died as a direct result of. There are story after story after story. To say that no one has ever died of THC is to say no one has ever died of tobacco because no one's ever overdosed <laughs> from tobacco, but people die from it all the time. Have states that have legalized marijuana seen an increase in traffic accidents? And is there a way to actually measure scientifically these DUIs? So, um, yes to traffic evidence, for sure. The National Institute, uh, National Dry, oh, and I, it's a, NHTSA. NHTSA's yeah. got wonderful data. Um, and oh gosh, I hope she doesn't watch this because Aaron, my friend Aaron gathers all of it. I'm sorry, I can't get your last names missing me, Aaron. Um, NHTSA has wonderful data on, on this. Yes, in fact, the, the, the insurance rates go up in recreational states um, because we, we have to pay for this. And is there a way to measure this? No. The science that we concluded in Colorado, so what we decided was it was going to be five nanograms per milliliter would determine a non per se intoxication. The science was junk science. It always has been. What you'll, what you'll keep hearing, there's a woman actually out of your general area named Marilyn Hustis, who's probably the world's leading researcher on this subject. And, and she told me a couple of years ago that I will not see a solution for it in my lifetime. You cannot determine whether or not somebody is intoxicated by having them blow 0.08. It doesn't work that way because the fat soluble nature of THC. Kids who grew up with a diagnosis of ADHD now are deciding to not take their meds and go with natural cannabis. What advice do you have for parents? Is this a good idea? Um, so natural cannabis is the word they'll throw natural before it. But remember, natural would be a one-to-one -one ratio of THC to CBD under 1%. So let's say they're just going with cannabis and probably store-bought cannabis. No, it is not a good idea. Um, THC is contraindicated for someone with ADHD. That means not only does it mean we're, we're not saying um, it's not a good idea to do it together, we're saying it's going to make it worse. So no, the answer to that is no. That the problem is it masks symptoms a lot of the time. And, um, it, but, but then the, the issues continue to progress and get worse. So think of the person who has a toothache and the snake oil salesman comes to town and sells them a 95 proof um, you know, miracle cure, and, and they drink the miracle cure, and their tooth doesn't hurt anymore, <laughs> but they haven't done anything to work on the decay. So a lot of the times that's the problem with this, is it'll mask some symptomology, but it'll come back with a vengeance. So no, contraindicated for someone with ADD, ADHD. Does marijuana affect long and short-term memory? Yes, um, both. So I, so Anytime you affect short-term memory stacking, obviously you affect long-term, yes, um, because, and yes, both and quite significantly. The gay, lesbian, and transgender community at greater risk than other communities with regards to THC addiction? Yeah, so I actually broke this down. I, I gave a TED talk a, a couple of years ago and I, I broke this down. Um, and the reason why, I don't know if it's necessarily has anything to do with anyone's sexuality, um, but we know that there's much higher instances of mental illness inside of the LGBT uh, Cuba uh, plus uh, community. And so with higher instances of mental illness come higher instances of, of THC abuse, addiction, and issues associated with. So as a rule, the LGBTQ plus community does consume um, higher uh, amounts of THC, yes. Regarding the, uh, the amount of THC in marijuana that's in legal states such as Colorado, is it because drug dealers are purchasing them in Colorado and selling them to other states? What, what numbers do we know that could be some of that product from the dispensaries leaving the state? Oh my goodness, yeah. We've got, I, I mean, um, the interdiction is the term that they use. Um, they have uh, just, I mean, not even from like UPS and FedEx and, and DHL, the United States Postal Service has um, hundreds and hundreds of examples of 
THC products being mailed out of Colorado to all 50 states. Um, so yeah, and, and listen, anybody who understands anything about how drug dealing works, you buy in quantity, you cut that into smaller amounts and you sell for a market price. Yes, <laughs> it's being sent all over the country. In fact, I haven't seen the numbers in the last two reports, but it would have been 2017, 2016, 2017. Um, the Marijuana Enforcement Division in Colorado estimated that of the grows that they knew of, the registered grows, they were growing about twice as much cannabis as all of Colorado could consume. So yeah, don't worry, Connecticut, you can get your Colorado ganja. <laughs> With the potency of the THC and marijuana out there today, is there such a thing as now being able to be a social weed smoker similar to being a social drinker? Totally, yes, for sure. In fact, um, it would appear that, that it's, that's the reality of it with most substances. So um, you, you wanna know something crazy that, that there's a bunch of variations with it and things. It depends on how pure it is and, and method of ingestion. Um, but most people, uh, um, somewhere in the mid to high 40% of people who um, experiment with heroin don't develop a dependency on it. So, but you're still looking in the mid 40%. So safe? Oh, good God, no. No, 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 don't misinterpret that. But no, of, of course not. There's no one thing, not even meth, that if you use it one time, it's gonna addict absolutely everybody. The problem is that inside of our society, I feel like what we've done is we've sort of thrown away all those people who have the issues with it the people who have severe substance use disorder, the people who have mental illness and the people who've got these problems are the ones who were like, well, come on, most people use it without a problem. Most people do, but I know a lot of folks who don't. Are edibles safer than smoking weed? So I would prefer someone to eat something over smoking something most days, yes. However, um, it metabolizes... <laughs> But when you smoke, the advantage to that is that when somebody smokes, if they get feeling nutty, um, psychotic would be the word, they just set it down. The problem is there's, there's so much THC in so many of these edibles, and it's got to work its way through your entire digestive system. So once it's in, and I've got a whole talk I'll do on edibles sometimes, um, you can't do anything. Uh, activated charcoal, induced vomiting, none of these things work. Once it's in, it's got to work its way through your whole digestive system. And then it actually is processed through your liver um, it, it, as opposed to coming in through the lung. So um, it's better because you're not inhaling smoke and it's worse because it's a lot less predictable. In fact, the vast majority of um, the, the, the big loud deaths that we know about come from people who... Um, consume an edible and then have a psychotic episode on the back end. When a related question, can you get a specific lung illness just from smoking marijuana? We don't know. Uh, and the reason why we don't know is because it's traditionally always been so difficult to isolate only cannabis smokers who don't also smoke tobacco. Um, so we don't know the answer to that. We, we know you can from vaping, but uh, at least if somebody knows, I don't. And a similar uh, answer, as you mentioned, even some people with heroin don't develop a full-blown addiction. How does addiction to marijuana and THC compare to other drugs? How does it compare? To, addiction is addiction is addiction. Addiction ruins lives. Addiction destroys families. Addiction robs you of your potential. Addiction is, is one of the fundamentally most significant issues that our society is, a fa is facing. And whether it is addiction to methamphetamine, to alcohol, to cannabis, to gambling, addiction is a devastating disease that destroys lives and families. So we don't, we don't do that in my world. We don't do the comparing to like, oh, here's addiction A and this is addiction B. Addiction is addiction is addiction and it is devastating. Because when you were willing to, not willing to, when you have to forego all of these other things for that substance, there's a lot that's lost. I know you said you weren't going to go on the side of the fence tonight, but three people have asked this question. Is it true that CBD is healthy for you? Healthy for you? 
healthy for you or good for you, I guess. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is our conversation. CBD absolutely has some great properties. And I think, now I, I don't think, Journal Psychiatry said um, last year that we'll probably get some CBD-based medications that are um, a, a new wave of antipsychotics. However, listen to this, listen people, listen, reach in your pockets, look in your purse, grab that thing out of your desk drawer. What you have is not CBD unless you've paid a really significant amount for it because there's no federal oversight for this. There's no FDA. You can say anything is CBD. I am wearing a CBD infused shirt right now and none of you can prove to me that I'm not. Uh, and it's everything is being sold as CBD. If you actually want to get the benefits of CBD, of which there absolutely are plenty, you talk to your doctor about Marinol, Sativex, Epidiolex. Talk to your doctor about one of these drugs that, that's CBD based, but FDA approved. Thank you for that. <laughs> How many more questions here? Um, has this THC been increased on purpose? People seem puzzled why it's, is this been a strategy? The yes. increase, yes. Of course, a strategy by the people who sell it because it makes it more addictive. Yes, period, stop. <laughs> All right. Why do you think sports teams like the uh, Major League Baseball are allowing marijuana use? You, you're asking a gigantic and complex question, and you're ask, also asking a question from some of these things that I um, have material knowledge of and sit behind doors where we promise we won't talk about. So I'm, I'm going to, to punt on that one, I'm sorry. Does using THC disturb the internal cannabinoid system in the brain? Oh yeah, it sure as heck does. Well, well, well said. So the and and actually the the internal cannabinoid system that you have inside of your brain is is um, not just inside your brain; it's through your whole body. So you, you would see it throughout the whole um, uh, your your whole nervous system as well, so up and down the spine and all the way down and out. And and yes, it it absolutely does disturb and disrupt that, especially this really high potency stuff. So if you've got that receptor and if it's used to having one little attachment point to it, and all of a sudden it's constantly enveloped in, oh 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 yeah, it'll. There, there's some big long-term issues that we're starting to see with it as well. But the simple answer to that is yes. Why is it that using marijuana has short-term effects, but it stays in your system so long? Because <laughs> uh, THC is fat soluble. That's why. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Great. The FDA, somebody wants to know, what did the FDA, why did the FDA approve CBD? Did the FDA approve CBD? You're oh, saying good that God, no. Yeah, it's not FDA approved. New. That's where the confusion is again. Right. right. This one guy, I don't know if he's looking, you know, to go back in history, but he wants to know, are there even 80 and 90 weeds still out there? Are, is it gotten so potent all across the board or can people still get something that's uh, less THC in its content? Of course you can. Yeah. In fact, there's a group of guys in Boulder because Boulder, um, who are attempting to preserve heirloom cannabis plant seeds. Um, so, you know, two, three, four percent things to keep them from getting all Monsanto. Yes, of course. And um, you probably could even find some of them commercially if you go to the right place. Uh, just like, you know, you can buy decaf, decaf at Starbucks if, if you go in. I don't know who does that, um, but you, you, you can. It would be a tiny, tiny, tiny little part of the market and probably a, a niche thing that you'd have to go. The best bet would be if you want 4% THC, grow 4% THC because there's just not a market for it because it's not addictive in the same way. So Connecticut is taking up legalization of recreational marijuana in its, in its upcoming session in the legislature. How do you sell that on-the-fence representative or senator, senator on uh, that legalization uh, for recreation use is not good for Connecticut? Well, um, I, I don't think you can do it briefly. I think you've got to have a good command of the, the thing. I would encourage you to reach out to Sam, um, to Smart Approaches to Marijuana. I know that um, 
stuff was delayed in New York and, and um, stuff's been delayed in New Jersey and stuff gets delayed all the time, the, the more um, effort gets put into that. I, I know a woman in New York once bought a copy of my book for every single state lawmaker and sent it and then hounded them about it. Um, you, you just, you, you, you don't let it happen softly. That's how you do it. You, you push back and you engage and you have those conversations because listen, the reality is that the, the, these lawmakers are, um, most of them are here for absolutely the right reasons and they love their communities and they love what it is that they do. The problem is they're only ever getting one side of the story because there's so much money being spent on lobbyists to tell them that side of the story. And we don't have lobbyists on our side. So um, you, you, you got to counter a well-crafted, well-funded message. John, I know we're, I want to be careful. We're just, yeah, we got one more question and then we're going to wrap up. So perfect timing. We're on the same page. With what you just shared with us tonight, giving us some real compelling data and concern about the THC increase in the level of THC, are there any states that are looking at putting restrictions on the level of THCs in their products? Yeah, Colorado would, uh, is giving it a real shot. Vermont made a pass at it, but it's kind of a funny one um, that doesn't have any teeth. Um, but I, I, my best guess is that you will see the first meaningful attempt at that come out of Colorado. There have been attempts for the last six years, but they just get killed before anything happens. Because um, again, you lower that, you're going to lower the profits. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're going to see something come out of Colorado this year. Thank you, Ben, for answering a lot of questions. <laughs> I now get to turn it over to Paul. Thank you. Thank you, um, and John. And, and on behalf of the support group and everyone this evening, I just want to say thank you, Ben, for sharing your insights. This has been a true gift for our community. And yes, um, we will have replays available. Um, we will have it on our YouTube channel and we will have it on our website. And um, everyone that attended, uh, uh, we will make sure we send an email with the link. So um, I just want to um, thank you again, Ben, and um, say goodbye to everybody. Goodbye.